Dr. Arian Tavakoli, welcome uh, on Veggie Channel. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us and we would like to listen from you what was about your today's talk at uh, VegMed uh, 2019. We are in London at the moment. We know that you are very much concerned with uh, the relationship between the plant-based diets and the cancer. So could you please tell us about, um, the, uh, for example, what are the advantages of uh, assuming more plants in your diet? Yes, of course. So my talk was called Cancer, What You Can Do About It. Okay. Just to give you a bit of background, um, I, by training I'm a respiratory physician, so I'm a specialist in respiratory medicine. And I worked in that field for many years in hospital medicine, but I chose to leave it a couple of years ago and to open my own clinic, which is Quantum Clinic in East Sussex in the UK. Uh, the reason I decided to do that was because I really wanted to be able to offer more to my patients than I was able to give within a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. And part of that was nutritional advice, of course. Mm -hmm. In my clinic now, I support people with cancer mm -hmm. using an integrative medicine and functional medicine approach. So integrative medicine, for mm -hmm. people who are not familiar with the term, is um, finding the best solution to a problem using both conventional treatments and evidence-informed non-conventional therapies. And functional medicine is basically root cause medicine. It's trying to identify the underlying issues that could have caused a disease to arise in the first okay, place. When you say not conventional, what kind of other, what other medicine are you? It can really be anything. It's evidence-informed. So there are studies, but it's not necessarily large randomized control studies. So okay. these therapies are not necessarily in national guidelines, but there is evidence to show their efficacy. So for example, in the field of cancer, mm -hmm. um, uh, local hypothermia, a particular one that I use is called modulated electrohypothermia, also mm -hmm. known as onchothermia, which is in widespread use in Europe and other parts of the world as a kind of a complementary therapy for cancer. Mm -hmm. Also oxygen therapies like hyperbaric oxygen, exercise with oxygen therapy, mm -hmm. mistletoe therapy. There are lots of um, evidence-informed okay. complementary therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anything which could work, actually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the people, in fact, all of the people I see have a, a very advanced cancer. So they're stage okay. four cancer patients. So um, either they're receiving treatment already or mm -hmm. they've received treatment and the treatment's failed and mm -hmm. now they're on palliative treatment. So a lot of people from the UK travel to Europe or even further afield mm -hmm. to seek you know, other possible avenues of treatment. Yes. And I was saying in my talk, I was uh, actually talking about some people who had achieved complete remission after a terminal mm -hmm. cancer diagnosis and what kind of things they did in order yes. to do that mm -hmm. because there are certain similarities in people who have achieved this these people do exist who achieve complete remission even after a very um, poor prognosis is given mm -hmm. to them so perhaps I can tell you what similarities they have yes um, please because <laughs> the first one is they all radically change their diet okay so specifically they either completely eradicate or significantly reduce the mm -hmm. intake of meat sugar dairy and um, processed foods, you know, refined foods. And at the same time, they increase their intake of fruits and vegetables, um, filtered water, mm -hmm. and organic foods. So that's what they do with their diet. But then there's a whole load of things they do in terms of their mind and their emotions. For example, mm -hmm. they release negative emotions like mm -hmm. anger and bitterness and regret. Of course, we know that our stress hormone cortisol, which oh, is released yeah. in stressful situations, mm -hmm. is also a cancer driver. So anything they do to okay. reduce that. And this happens in a short period of time or takes takes a long, long time to these changes? Um, so the changes I'm talking about are based on a book called Radical Remission, written okay. by Dr. Kelly Turner. Okay. They're changes that she found, um, she interviewed a thousand people who had achieved complete remission after a terminal diagnosis uh -huh. or who were doing much better than expected, you know, following a very poor mm -hmm. prognosis. And so she found that all these people shared nine similarities. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was over a period of time, but mm -hmm. they all did these nine things in addition to lots mm -hmm. of other things. So they shared these nine characteristics. So okay. one of them was the, was the dietary change. And then a lot of mental emotional factors, mm -hmm. uh, releasing suppressed emotions, increasing positive emotions, embracing social support, uh, finding a deeper mm -hmm. connection with the universe or a spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. All of these things made a big difference. So yes, that, that was <laughs> yes, part yes, of my I'm, talk I'm as well. willing to know what is the, the power of the changing the diet uh, in respect of these uh, kind of illnesses like uh, cancer? So there is a lot of data showing that people on plant-strong diets do much mm -hmm. better um, in the long run with cancer. When I say plant-strong diets, I mean diets rich in fruits, vegetables, whole mm -hmm. grains and beans. Low in fat, that's very important because fat is known to be 
one of the mechanisms that cancer cells use in mm -hmm. order to spread and metastasize. So any kind of fat? Saturated fat, yeah, saturated. yeah which is mainly from animal products. Okay. Um, so low in fat, low in refined foods, uh, mm. so basically a whole food, plant-based mm. nutrition. As I said, there's lots of data on this. This is why the World Cancer Research Fund is now recommending a higher intake of fruits, vegetables, whole grains mm -hmm. and legumes, and a low intake, if any, of, mm -hmm. of meat and fats. And they recommend this both for, for the prevention of cancer and also after a diagnosis of cancer to improve mm. the outcome. There are also um, Lots of studies, there are meta-analyses showing, for example, there's one meta-analysis on nearly 10,000 women with breast cancer who were followed up and some of them ha were ha eating a low-fat diet, some of them were eating a high-fat diet, and they found that the women on a low-fat diet had mm -hmm. about a 25% reduced risk of recurrence mm -hmm. of breast cancer. So that was generally women who were eating more plant mm -hmm. foods. There was another randomized controlled trial on uh, almost 50,000 people mm -hmm. with, um, with cancer that were followed up for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And it was found that there was about a 50% reduction in mortality mm -hmm. in those who were eating a low-fat diet, mainly plant-based diet. So there's a lot of strong evidence out mm -hmm. there for eating plant foods. World mm -hmm. Health Organization, of course, has classified processed meat as a grade one carcinogen and red meat as a grade two A carcinogen, which is a probable carcinogen. There needs to be change uh, on an individual level, on a community and national level, on an international level. I do believe that there has been uh, dramatic changes in the, in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So taking the UK alone, the sales of plant-based foods has mm -hmm. rocketed in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, before you would go into supermarkets, you wouldn't really see a plant-based section. Now you go into any supermarket and there is a dedicated vegan section, dedicated vegetarian section. Mm -hmm. This is in almost any normal supermarket that you go into. The numbers of vegans has risen. The awareness, especially amongst young people, mm -hmm. of the necessity to move to plant-based diet has, has increased significantly. Um, and this is linked very much as well to the climate issues, of course, and the okay. environmental issues that we've all become aware of. So, yes, uh, there does need to be huge improvements, mm. but I think that over the recent past there have mm. been dramatic changes. I think it will continue that way. So, uh, concerning your, your clinic here in, in England, uh, do you have uh, some kind of results we could consider as uh, scientific evidence? So, I opened my clinic uh, two years ago. Okay. I started my cancer program um, about six months ago. Mm -hmm. So, it's really too early it's for early. me to give some personal data. It, I, I can't give any personal data. But um, other patients have told me of, mm -hmm. of their experiences. For example, I know of a man with advanced prostate cancer mm -hmm who uh, was his, his uh, prostate-specific antigen, which is a tumor marker measured in the blood, was being monitored. And this is something that's elevated in prostate cancer. So he was following a plant-based diet, and he, amongst uh, other therapies, he had standard mm -hmm. treatment as well, of course. And his PSA, prostate-specific antigen, came down to normal. He then heard about the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which is a high-fat diet, yes. started that because he got excited Why? about that. Well, there is data to suggest mm. that sometimes tumors can reduce in size okay. in the early stages of a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of excitement about that in some circles. So he started that. What he didn't know is that prostate cancer is relies perhaps even more so than other cancers on fat as a spreading mechanism. Okay. So he then started a high fat diet and watched his PSA start climbing. Mm -hmm. Stopped it straight away, went back to a whole food plant-based diet, PSA came back down again. So I talked about these nine similarities. Mm -hmm. I talked a lot about, um, yes, the, the importance of addressing the mind in cancer. In fact, mm -hmm. there's one thing that I would put ahead of even whole food plant-based nutrition when dealing with cancer, and that is the mind. I think the mind is probably the most powerful therapeutic tool that we have. Okay. And it's almost completely ignored, you know, in medical yeah. consultations. But again, there are studies, there are lots of studies looking at this, looking at the effect of imagination, mm -hmm. visual imagery, and how we can even impact our physiological status using regular imagery. So I told the audience about a study that was done on 80 women with breast cancer who were receiving conventional treatment for the breast cancer. And uh, the intervention group, so mm -hmm. half the women were trained how to use visual imagery to mm -hmm. uh, visualize their natural killer cells, which is a particular kind of cell that kills cancer cells. 
identifying and eliminating their cancer cells, and they did this regularly over several weeks. So at the end of this study, the researchers took blood tests from the women who did the regular vis visualization and the women who didn't, and they found that the women who did had higher levels of activity of their natural killer cells, okay. the very cells that find and detect and eliminate cancer cells. So therefore they found a physiological response based mm -hmm. purely on regular thought patterns and visualization. Mm -hmm. It's a very fascinating area and one that we really don't utilize in medicine, we should. So there's lots of mind-body therapies um, that can be used. I mean, visualization. Myself, I use hypnotherapy as part of my clinical practice. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of things in my clinic that whole food plant-based nutrition is the foundation. Mm -hmm. But I offer a number of complementary therapies as well. And I also offer hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. So hypnotherapy can be thought of as a kind of a guided visualization, although it's more than that. And again, done regularly. And if the patient practices themselves at home, mm -hmm. again, um, that can be very beneficial. So I use hypnotherapy, mm -hmm. but you know, just uh, a creative visualization, meditation, even um, mm -hmm. even just imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, just using your imagination is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Again, there was a study that I talked about in, in my mm -hmm. talk. Actually, there are a lot of studies on the really? effect of the imagination mm -hmm. on the brain, but this one they studied patients using, using something called functional MRI scanning. So they were scanning the brain. And one group of patients were looking at uh, drawings of simple objects while their brain was being scanned. And another group of patients were just imagining the objects. Okay. The, the objects were being described to them. So what they found was that the same areas of the brain was being activated, mm -hmm. whether the people were actually looking at the drawings mm -hmm. or whether they were just imagining they were looking at the drawings. So mm -hmm. this would suggest that the brain doesn't actually differentiate between reality mm -hmm. and imagination, which is probably why using regular imagination has been shown to create physiological impact. Very interesting. Hope to meet with you again and maybe go deeper into these subjects. Are very, very interesting. I would love to. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. See you again. Thank you.